Hi, welcome back to Cosmic and Body Horror. If you enjoy my content, please consider hitting the like button. It's the only way the YouTube algorithm notices me. H.P. Lovecraft, master of weird fiction, has something unusual to say in Dagon. This is the first of a series of remarkable stories that H.P. Lovecraft is writing for Weird Tales. The second will appear in an early issue. Dagon by H.P. Lovecraft First published Weird Tales, October 1923 I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more, penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug, which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German sea raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the enemy's navy had not reached its later degree of ruthlessness, so that our vessel was made legitimate prize. Whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners, so liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors, that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship, or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastnesses of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When at last I awaked, it was to discover myself, half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished, for there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish, and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing, and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime, yet the very completeness of the stillness and homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions which for innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me, that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, strain my ears as I might. Nor were there any seafowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade, as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness, and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for travelling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. 
On the third morning I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odour of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I camped, and on the following day still travelled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first spied it. By the fourth evening I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance, an intervening valley, setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but before the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me, but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse, which I cannot definitely analyse, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me, an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express for despite its enormous magnitude, and its location in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship, and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size, were an array of base reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a door. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shewn disporting like fishes in waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms, I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint, grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer.
They were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seemed to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale represented as but little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe, some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born, awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist. I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then suddenly I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemus-like, and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then, of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat. I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal, and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I reached the boat, at any rate. I know that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist, and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god, but soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional. I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am going to end matters, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Often I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm, a mere freak of fever, as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind, of a day when the land shall sink, and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand, the window, the window. End of Dagon by H. P. Lovecraft Here's a story of creeping horror that rises, gradually, to a powerful climax. It's a story not easily forgotten. The Phantom Farmhouse by Seabury Quinn First published Weird Tales, October 1923 I had been at the new Brecliffe Sanitarium nearly three weeks before I actually saw the house. Every morning, as I lay abed after the nurse had taken my temperature, I wondered what was beyond the copse of fir and spruce at the turn of the road. The picture seemed incomplete without chimneys rising among the evergreens. I thought about it so much I finally convinced myself there really was a house in the wood, a house where people lived and worked and were happy, all during the long, trying days when I was learning to navigate a wheelchair. I used to picture the house and the people who lived in it. There would be a father, I was sure, 
a stout, good-natured father, somewhat bald, who sat on the porch and smoked a cob pipe in the evening. And there was a mother, too, a wasteless, plaid-skirted mother with hair smoothly parted over her forehead, who sat beside the father as he rocked and smoked, and who had a brown work-basket in her lap. She spread the stocking feet over her outstretched fingers, and her vigilant needles spied out and closed every hole with a cunning no mechanical loom could rival. Then there was a daughter. I was a little hazy in my conception of her, but I knew she was tall and slender as a hazel wand, and that her eyes were blue and wide and sympathetic. Picturing the house and its people became a favorite pastime with me during the time I was acquiring the art of walking all over again. By the time I was able to trust my legs on the road, I felt I knew my way to my vision friend's home, as well as I knew the byways of my own parish, though I had as yet not set foot outside the sanitarium. Oddly enough, I chose the evening for my first long stroll. It was unusually warm for September in Maine, and some of the sturdier of a convalescence had been playing tennis during the afternoon. After dinner they sat on the veranda, comparing notes on their respective cases of influenza or matching experiences in appendicitis operations. After building the house bit by bit from my imagination, as a child pieces together a picture puzzle, I should have been bitterly disappointed if the woods had proved empty, yet when I reached the turn of the road and found my dream house a reality, I was almost afraid. Bit for bit, and part for part, it was as I had visualized it. A long, rambling, comfortable-looking farmhouse it was, with a wide porch screened by vines and a whitewashed picket fence about the little clearing before it. There was a tumble-down gate in the fence, one of the kind that is held shut with a weighted chain. Looking closely, I saw the weight was a disused plowshare. Leading from gate to porch was a path of flat stones, laid unevenly in the short grass and bordered with a double row of clamshells. A lamp burned in the front room, sending out cheerful golden rays to meet the silver moonlight. A strange, eerie sensation came over me as I stood there. Somehow, I felt I had seen that house before, many, many times before, yet I had never been in that part of Maine till I came to Briarcliff, nor had anyone ever described the place to me. Indeed, except for my idle dreams, I had had no intimation that there was a house in those pines at all. Who lives in the house at the turn of the road? I asked the fat man who roomed next to me. He looked at me as blankly as if I had addressed him in Choctaw then countered. What road? Why, the south road, I explained. I mean the house in the pines, just beyond the curve, you know. If such a thing had not been obviously absurd, I should have thought he looked frightened at my answer. Certainly his already prominent eyes started a bit further from his face. Nobody lives there, he assured me. Nobody's lived there for years. There isn't any house there. I became angry. What right had this fellow to make my civil question the occasion for an ill-timed jest? As you please, I replied. Perhaps there isn't any house there for you, but I saw one there last night. My God! he ejaculated, and hurried away as if I'd just told him I was infected with smallpox. Later in the day I overheard a snatch of conversation between him and one of his acquaintances in the lounge. I tell you it's so, he was saying with great earnestness. I thought it was all a lot of poppycock, myself, but that clergyman saw it last night. I'm going to pack my traps and get back to the city, and not waste any time about it, either. Rats! His companion scoffed. He must have been stringing you. Turning to light a cigar, he caught sight of me. Say, Mr. Weatherby, he called. You didn't mean to tell my friend here that you really saw a house down by those pines last night, did you? I certainly did, I answered. And I tell you, too, there's nothing unusual about it, is there? Is there? he repeated. Is there? Say, what it looked like. I described it to him as well as I could, and his eyes grew as wide as those of a child hearing the story of Bluebeard. Well, I'll be a Chinaman's uncle, he declared as I finished. I sure will. See here, I demanded. What's all the mystery about that farmhouse? Why shouldn't I see it? It's there to be seen, isn't it? He gulped once or twice, as if there was something hot in his mouth, before he answered. Look here, Mr. Weatherby, I'm telling you this for your own good. You'd better stay in O'Nights, and you'd better stay away from those pines in particular. Nonplussed at this unsolicited advice, 
I was about to ask an explanation when I detected the after-tang of whiskey on his breath. I understood. Then, I was being made the butt of a drunken joke by a pair of racecourse followers. I'm very much obliged. I'm sure, I replied with dignity. But if you don't mind, I'll choose my own comings and goings. Oh, go as far as you like. He waved his arms wide in token of my complete free agency. Go as far as you like. I'm going to New York. And he did. The pair of them left the sanitarium that afternoon. A slight recurrence of my illness held me housebound for several days after my conversation with the two sportively. Inclined gentlemen, and the next time I ventured out at night, the moon had waxed to the full, pouring a flood of light upon the earth that rivaled midday. The mintest objects were as readily distinguished as they would have been before sunset. In fact, I remember comparing the evening to a silver-plated noon. As I trudged along the road to the pine cops, I was busy formulating plans for intruding into the family circle at the farmhouse, devising all manner of pious frauds by which to scrape acquaintance. Shall I feign having lost my way, and inquire direction to the sanitarium? Or shall I ask if some mythical acquaintance, a John Squires, for instance, lives there? I asked myself, as I neared the turn of the road. Fortunately for my conscience, all these subterfuges were unnecessary, for as I neared the whitewashed fence, a girl left the porch and walked quickly to the gate, where she stood gazing pensively along the moonlit road. It was almost as if she were coming to meet me, I thought, as I slackened my pace and assumed an air of deliberate casualness. Almost abreast of her, I lowered my cadence still more and looked directly at her. Then I knew why my conception of the girl who lived in that house had been misty and indistinct. For the same reason the Venerable John had faltered in his description of the New Jerusalem until his vision in the Isle of Patmos. From the smoothly parted hair above her wide, forget-me-not eyes, to the hem of her white cotton frock, she was as slender and lovely as a Rossetti saint, as wonderful to the eye as a medieval poet's vision of his lost love in paradise. Her forehead, evenly framed in the beaten bronze of her hair, was wide and high and startlingly white, and her brows were delicately penciled as if laid on by an artist with a camel's hairbrush. The eyes themselves were sweet and clear as forest pools mirroring the September sky, and lifted a little at the corners, like an oriental's, giving her face a quaint, exotic look in the midst of these main woods. So slender was her figure, that the swell of her bosom was barely perceptible under the light stuff of her dress, and, as she stood immobile in the nimbus of moon rays. The undulation of the line from her shoulders to ankles was what painters call a curve of motion. One hand rested lightly on the gate, finely cut as a bit of Italian sculpture, and scarcely less white than the limed wood supporting it. I noticed idly that the forefinger was somewhat longer than its fellows, and that the nails were almond-shaped and very pink, almost red, as if they had been rouged and brightly polished. No man can take stock of a woman thus, even in a cursory, fleeting glimpse, without her being aware of the inspection, and in the minute my eyes drank up her beauty, our glances crossed and held. The look she gave back was as calm and unperturbed as though I had been non-existent. One might have thought I was an invisible wraith of the night, yet the faint suspicion of a flush quickening in her throat, and cheeks told me she was neither unaware nor unappreciative of my scrutiny. Mechanically, I raised my cap, and wholly without conscious volition, I heard my own voice asking, May I trouble you for a drink from your well? I'm from the sanitarium, only a few days out of bed, in fact, and I fear I've overdone myself in my walk. A smile flitted across her rather wide lips, quick and sympathetic as a mother's response to her child's request, as she swung the gate open for me. Surely, she answered, and her voice had all the sweetness of the south wind soughing through her native pines. Surely you may drink at our well, and rest yourself, too, if you wish. She preceded me up the path, quickening her pace as she neared the house, and running nimbly up the steps to the porch. From where I stood beside the old-fashioned well, fitted with windlass and bucket, I could hear the sound of whispering voices in earnest conversation. Hers I recognized, lowered though it was, by the flute-like purling of its tones. The other two were deeper, and, it seemed to me, hoarse and throaty. Somehow, odd as it seemed, there was a queer, 
canine note in them, dimly reminding me of the muttering of not-too-friendly dogs, such fractious growls I had heard while doing missionary duty in Alaska. When the savage, half-wolf Malamutes were not fed promptly at the relay stations, her voice rose a thought higher, as if in argument, and I fancied I heard her whisper, This one is mine, I tell you, mine. I'll brook no interference. Go to your own hunting. An instant more there was a reluctant assenting growl from the shadow of the vines curtaining the porch, and a light laugh from the girl as she descended the steps, swinging a bright tin cup in her hand. For a second she looked at me, as she sent the bucket plunging into the stone-curbed well. Then she announced, in explanation, We're great hunters here, you know. The season is just in, and Dad and I have the worst quarrels about whose game is whose. She laughed in recollection of their argument, and I laughed with her. I had been quite a nimrod as a boy, myself, and well I remembered the heated controversies as to whose charge of shot was responsible for some luckless bunny's demise. The well was very deep, and my breath was coming fast by the time I had helped her wind the bucket rope upon the windlass, but the water was cold as only spring-fed well water can be. As she poured it from the bucket it shone almost like foam in the moonlight, and seemed to whisper with a half-human voice, instead of gurgling as other water does when poured. I had drunk water in nearly every quarter of the globe, but never such water as that. Cold as the breath from a glacier, limpid as visualized air, it was yet so light and tasteless in substance that only the chill in my throat and the sight of the liquid in the cup told me that I was doing more than going through the motions of drinking. And now, will you rest? She invited, as I finished my third draft. We've an extra chair on the porch for you. Behind the screen of vines, I found her father and mother seated in the rays of the big kitchen lamp. They were just as I had expected to find them. Plain, homely, sincere country folk, courteous in their reception and anxious to make a sick stranger welcome. Both were stout, with the comfortable stoutness of middle age and good health, but both had surprisingly slender hands. I noticed, too, that the same characteristic of an overlong forefinger was apparent in their hands as in their daughters, and that both their nails were trimmed to points and stained almost a brilliant red. My father, Mr. Squires, the girl introduced, and my mother, Mrs. Squires. I could not repress a start. These people bore the very name I had casually thought to use when inquiring for some imaginary person. My lucky stars had surely guided me away from that attempt to scrape an acquaintance. What a figure I should have cut if I had actually asked for Mr. Squires. Though I was not aware of it, my curious glance must have stayed longer on their reddened nails than I had intended, for Mrs. Squires looked deprecatingly at her hands. We've all been turning in, putting up fox grapes. She included her husband and daughter with a comprehensive gesture. And the stain just won't wash out has to wear off, you know. I spent, perhaps, two hours with my newfound friends, talking of everything from the best methods of potato culture to the surest way of landing a nine-pound base. All three joined in the conversation and took a lively interest in the topics under discussion. After the vapid talk of the guests at the sanitarium, I found the simple, interested discourse of these country people as stimulating as wine, and when I left them, it was with a hearty promise to renew my call at an early date. Better wait until after dark, Mr. Squires warned. We'd be glad to see you any time, but we're so busy these four days. We haven't much time for company. I took the broad hint in the same friendly spirit it was given. It must have grown chillier than I realized while I sat there, for my new friend's hands were clay-cold when I took them in mine at parting. Homeward bound, a whimsical thought struck me so suddenly I laughed aloud. There was something suggestive of the dog tribe about the squire's family, though I could not for the life of me say what it was. Even Mildred, the daughter, beautiful as she was, with her light eyes, her rather prominent nose and her somewhat wide mouth, reminded me in some vague way of a lovely silver collie I had owned as a boy. I struck a tassel of dried leaves from a cluster of weeds with my walking stick as I smiled at the fanciful conceit. The legend of the werewolf, those horrible monsters formed as men, but capable of assuming bestial shape at will, and killing and eating their fellows, was as old as mankind's fear of the dark. But no mythology I had ever read contained a reference to dog people. 
Strange fancies strike us in the moonlight, sometimes. September ripened to October, and the moon, which had been as round and bright as an exchange-worn coin when I first visited the squire's house, waned as thin as a shaving from a silversmith's lathe. I became a regular caller at the house in the pines. Indeed, I grew to look forward to my nightly visits with those homely folk as a welcome relief from the tediously gay companionship of the over-sophisticated people at the sanitarium. My habit of slipping away shortly after dinner was the cause of considerable comment, and no little speculation on the part of my fellow convalescents, some of whom set it down to the eccentricity which, to their minds, was the inevitable concomitant of a minister's vocation, while others were frankly curious. Snatches of conversation I overheard now, and then led me to believe that the objective of my strolls was the subject of W.A. Gehring, and the guarded questions put to me in an effort to solve the mystery became more and more an oying. I had no intention of taking any of them to the farmhouse with me. The squires were my. Their cheerful talk and unassuming manners were as delightful a contrast to the atmosphere of the sanitarium as a breath of mountain balsam after the fetid air of a hothouse, but to the city-centred crowd at Briarcliff they would have been only the objects of less than half scornful patronage, the source of pitying amusement. It was Miss Leahy who pushed the impudent curiosity further than any of the rest, however. One evening, as I was setting out, she met me at the gate and announced her intention of going with me. You must have found something dreadfully attractive to take you off every evening this way, Mr. Weatherby. She hazarded as she pursed her rather pretty, rouged lips at me and caught step with my walk. We girls really can't let some little country lass take you away from us, you know. We simply can't. I made no reply. It was scarcely possible to tell a pretty girl, even such a vain little flirt as Sarah Leahy, to go home and mind her business. Yet that was just what I wanted to do. But I would not take her with me. To that I made up my mind. I would stop at the turn of the road, just out of sight of the farmhouse, and cut across the fields. If she wanted to accompany me on a cross-country hike in high-heeled slippers, she was welcome to do so. Besides, she would tell the others that my wanderings were nothing more mysterious than nocturnal explorations of the nearby woods. Which bit of misinformation would satisfy the busybodies at Briarcliff and relieve me of? the espionage to which I was subjected, as well. I smiled grimly to myself as I pictured her climbing over fences and ditches in her flimsy party frock and beaded pumps, and lengthened my stride toward the woods at the road's turn. We marched to the limits of the field bordering the squire's grove in silence. I thinking of the mild revenge, I should soon wreak upon the pretty little busy body at my side, Miss Leahy too intent on holding the pace I set to waste breath in conversation. As we neared the woods she halted, an expression of worry, almost fear, coming over her face. I don't believe I'll go any farther, she announced. No, I replied, a trifle sarcastically. And is your curiosity so easily satisfied? It's not that, she turned half round, as if to retrace her steps. I'm afraid of those woods. Indeed, I queried. And what is there to be afraid of? Bears, Indians, or wildcats? I'd been through them several times without seeing anything terrifying. Now she had come this far, I was anxious to take her through the fields and underbrush. No, oh, Miss Leahy answered, a nervous quaver in her voice. I'm not afraid of anything like that. But, oh, I don't know what you call it. Pierre told me all about it the other day. Some kind of dreadful thing. Loop, loop, something or other. It's a French word, and I can't remember it. I was puzzled. Pierre Gironte was the ancient French-Canadian gardener at the sanitarium, and, like all doddering old men, would talk for hours to anyone who would listen. Also, like all habitants, he was full of the wild folklore his ancestors brought overseas with them generations ago. What did Pierre tell you? I asked. Why, he said that years ago some terrible people lived in these woods. They had the only house for miles round, and travellers stopped there for the night. Sometimes. But no stranger was ever seen to leave that place, once he went in. One night, the farmers gathered about the house and burned it, with the family that lived there. When the embers had cooled down they made a search, and found nearly a dozen bodies buried in the cellar. That was why no one ever came away from that dreadful place. 
They took the murdered men to the cemetery and buried them, but they dumped the charred bodies of the murderers into graves in the barnyard, without even saying a prayer over them. And Pierre says, Oh, look, look, she broke off her recital of the old fellow's story and pointed a trembling hand across the field to the edge of the woods. A second more, and she shrank against me, clutching at my coat with fear-stiffened fingers and crying with excitement and terror. I looked in the direction she indicated, myself a little startled by the abject fear that had taken such sudden hold on her. Something white and ungainly was running diagonally across the field from us, skirting the margin of the woods and making for the meadow that adjoined the sanitarium pasture. A second glance told me it was a sheep, probably one of the flock kept to supply our table with fresh meat. I was laughing at the strength of the superstition that could make the girl see a figure of horror in an innocent mutton that had strayed away from its fellows and was scared out of its silly wits, when something else attracted my attention. Loping along in the trail of the fleeing sheep, somewhat to the rear and a little to each side, were two other animals. At first glance they appeared to be a pair of large collies, but as I looked more intently, I saw that these animals were like nothing I had ever seen before. They were much larger than any collie, nearly as high as Saint. Bernard's, yet shaped in a general way like Alaskan sledge dogs, huskies. The farther one was considerably the larger of the two, and ran with a slight limp, as if one of its hind paws had been injured. As nearly as I could tell in the indifferent light, they were a rusty brown color, very thick-haired and unkempt in appearance. But the strangest thing about them was the fact that both were tailless, which gave them a terrifyingly grotesque look. As they ran, a third form, similar to the other two in shape, but smaller, slender as a greyhound, with much lighter-hued fur, broke from the thicket of short brush edging the wood and took up the chase. Emitting a series of short, sharp yelps, Sheep killers, I murmured, half to myself. Odd, I've never seen dogs like that before. They're not dogs, wailed Miss Leahy against my coat. They're not dogs. Oh, Mr. Weatherby, let's go away. Please, please take me home. She was rapidly becoming hysterical, and I had a difficult time with her on the trip back. She clung whimpering to me, and I had almost to carry her most of the way. By the time we reached the sanitarium, she was crying bitterly, shivering, as if with a chill, and went in without stopping to thank me for my assistance. I turned and made for the squire's farm with all possible speed, hoping to get there before the family had gone to bed. But when I arrived the house was in darkness, and my knock at the door received no answer. As I retraced my steps to the sanitarium I heard faintly, from the fields beyond the woods, the shrill, eerie cry of the sheep-killing dogs. A torrent of rain held us marooned the next day. Miss Leahy was confined to her room, with a nurse in constant attendance and the house doctor making hourly calls. She was on the verge of a nervous collapse, he told me, crying with a persistence that bordered on hysteria, and responding to treatment very slowly. An impromptu dance was organized in the great hall, and half a dozen bridge tables set up in the library, but as I was skilled in neither of these rainy day. Diversions. I put on a waterproof and patrolled the veranda for exercise. On my third or fourth trip around the house, I ran into old Geronte shuffling across the porch, wagging his head and muttering portentously to himself. See here, Pierre, I accosted him. What sort of nonsense have you been telling Miss Leahy about those pine woods down the south road? The old fellow regarded me unwinkingly with his beady eyes wrinkling his age-yellowed forehead for all the world like an elderly baboon inspecting a new sort of edible. Monsieur goes out alone much at nights, ne sais pas? he asked, at length. Yes, monsieur goes out alone much at night, I echoed. But what monsieur particularly desires to know is what sort of tales you have been telling Mademoiselle Leahy. Comprenez-vous? The network of wrinkles about his lips multiplied as he smiled enigmatically regarding me askance from the corners of his eyes. Monsieur is Anglais, he replied. He would not understand or believe. Never mind what I'd believe, I retorted. What is this story about murder and robbery being committed in those woods? Who were the murderers, and where did they live? Hein? For a few seconds he looked fixedly at me, chewing the cud of senility between his toothless gums. Then, glancing carefully about, 
as if he feared being overheard. He tiptoed up to me and whispered, Monsieur Mousses stay indoors these nights. Wean the moon, she shine. Yes, when she not show her face, no. There are evil things abroad at the dark of the moon, Mzua. Even Lass's night they kill three of my beast sheep. Remember, Monsieur, the loop guru. He is out when the moon hide her light. And with that he turned and left me. Nor could I get another word from him save his cryptic warning. Remember, Monsieur, the loop guru. Remember. In spite of my annoyance, I could not get rid of the unpleasant sensation the old man's words left with me. The loop garou, werewolf, he had said, and to prove his goblin wolf's presence, he had sighted the death of his three sheep. As I paced the rain-washed porch, I thought of the scene I had witnessed the night before, when the sheep killers were at their work. Well, I reflected, I've seen the loop garou on his native heath at last. From causes as slight as this, no doubt, the horrible legend of the werewolf had sprung. Time was when all France quaked at the sound of the loup garou's hunting call, and the bravest knights in Christendom trembled in their castles and crossed themselves fearfully because some renegade shepherd dog quested his prey in the night. On such a foundation are the legends of a people built, whistling a snatch from pinafore and looking skyward in search of a patch of blue in the clouds. I felt a tug at my raincoat sleeve, such as a neglected terrier might give. It was Geronte again. Monsieur, he began in the same mysterious whisper, the loup garou is a verity, certainly. I, myself, have never seen him. He paused to bless himself. But my cousin, Baptiste, was once pursued by him. Yes, it was near the shrine of the good saint Anne that Baptiste lived. One night he was sent to fetch the cur for a dying woman. They rode fast through the trees, the cur and my cousin Baptiste, for it was at the dark of the moon and the evil forest folk were abroad. And as they galloped, there came a loop guru from the woods, with eyes as bright as hellfire. It followed hard, this tailless hound from the devil's kennel, but they reached the house before it, and the cur put his book, with the holy cross on its cover, at the doorstep. The loop guru wailed under the windows like a child in pain until the sun rose. Then it slunk back to the forest. When my cousin Baptiste and the cur came out, they found its hand marks in the soft earth around the door. Very like your hand, or mine, they were, monsieur, save that the first finger was longer than the others. And did they find the loop garou? I asked. Something of the old man's earnestness communicated to me. Yes, monsieur, but of course, he replied gravely. Three weeks before a stranger, drowned in the river, had been buried without the office of the church. Ween, they opened his grave. They found his fingernails as red as blood, and sharp. Then they knew. The good cur read the burial office over him, and the poor soul that had been snatched away in sin slept peacefully at last. He looked quizzically at me, as if speculating whether to tell me more. Then, apparently fearing I would laugh at his outburst of confidence, started away toward the kitchen. Well, what else, Pierre? I asked feeling he had more to say. Non, 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 he replied. There is nothing more, monsieur. I did but want monsieur should know my own cousin, Baptiste Theronte, had seen the loup with his very eyes. Hearsay evidence, I commented, as I went in to dinner. During the rainy week that followed, I chafed at my confinement like a privileged convict suddenly deprived of his liberties and looked as wistfully down the south road as any prisoned gypsy ever gazed upon the open trail. The quiet home circle at the farmhouse, the unforced conversation of the old folks, Mildred's sweet companionship, all beckoned me with an almost irresistible force. For in this period of enforced separation, I discovered what I had dimly suspected for some time. I loved Mildred Squires, and, loving her, I longed to tell her of it. No lad intent on visiting his first sweetheart ever urged his feet more eagerly than I when, the curtains of rain at last drawn up, I hastened toward the house at the turn of the road. As I hoped, yet hardly dared expect, Mildred was standing at the gate to meet me as I rounded the curve, and I yearned toward her like a humming bird seeking its nest. She must have read my heart in my eyes, 
for her greeting smile was as tender as a mother's as she bends above her babe. At last you have come, my friend, she said, putting out both hands in welcome. I am very glad. We walked silently up the path, her fingers still resting in mine, her face averted. At the steps she paused, a little embarrassment in her voice as she explained. Father and mother are out. They have gone to a meeting. But you will stay. Surely, I acquiesced, and to myself I admitted my gratitude for this chance of Mildred's unalloyed company. We talked, but little that night. Mildred was strangely distrait, and, much as I longed to, I could not force a confession of my love from my lips. Once, in the midst of a long pause between our words, the cry of the sheep-killers came faintly to us, echoed across the fields and woods, and as the weird, shrill sound fell on our ears, she threw back her head with something of the gesture of a hunting dog scenting its quarry. Toward midnight she turned to me, a panic of fear having apparently laid hold of her. You must go, she exclaimed, rising and laying her hand on my shoulder. But your father and mother have not returned, I objected. Won't you let me stay until they get back? Oh, no, no, she answered, her agitation increasing. You must go at once, please. She increased her pressure on my shoulder almost as if to shove me from the porch. Taken aback by her sudden desire to be rid of me, I was picking up my hat. When she uttered a stifled little scream and ran quickly to the edge of the porch, interposing herself between me and the yard. At the same moment, I heard a muffled sound from the direction of the front gate, a sound like a growling and snarling of savage dogs. I leaped forward, my first thought being that the sheep-killers I had seen the other night had strayed to the squire's place. Crazed with blood, I knew they would be almost as dangerous to men as to sheep, and every nerve in my sickness-weakened body cried out to protect Mildred. To my blank amazement, as I looked from the porch I beheld Mr. and Mrs. Squires walking sedately up the path, talking composedly together. There was no sign of the dogs or any other animals about. As the elderly couple neared the porch, I noticed that Mr. Squires walked with a pronounced limp, and that both their eyes shone very brightly in the moonlight, as though they were suffused with tears. They greeted me pleasantly enough, but Mildred's anxiety seemed increased, rather than diminished, by their presence, and I took my leave after a brief exchange of civilities. On my way back, I looked intently in the woods bordering the road for some sign of the house of which Pierre had told Miss Leahy but everywhere the pines grew as thickly as thought neither axe nor fire had ever disturbed. D. them. Geronte is in his second childhood, I reflected, and like an elder child, he loves to terrify his juniors with fearsome witch tales. Yet an uncomfortable feeling was with me, till I saw the gleam of the sanitarium's lights across the fields, and as I walked toward them, it seemed to me that more than once I heard the baying of the sheep-killers in the woods. Behind me, a buzz of conversation, like the sibilant arguments of a cloud of swarming bees, greeted me as I descended the stairs to breakfast next morning. It appeared that Ned, one of the pair of great mastiffs attached to the sanitarium, had been found dead before his kennel, his throat and brisket torn open and several gaping wounds in his flanks. Boris, his fellow, had been discovered whimpering and trembling in the extreme corner of the doghouse, the embodiment of canine terror. Speculation as to the animal responsible for the outrage was rife, and, as usual, it ran the gamut of possible and impossible surmises. Every sort of beast from a grizzly bear to a lion escaped from the circus was in turn indicted for the crime, only to have a complete alibi straightway established. The only one having no suggestion to offer was old Geronte, who stood sphinx-like in the outskirts of the crowd, smiling sardonically to himself and wagging his head sagely. As he caught sight of me he nodded sapiently, as if to include me in the joint tenancy to some weighty secret. Presently he worked his way through the chattering group, and whispered, Monsieur, he was here last night, and with him was the other tailless one. Come and see. Plucking me by the sleeve, he led me to the rear of the kennels, and, stooping, pointed to something in the moist earth. You see? he asked, as if a printed volume lay for my reading in the mud. I see that someone has been on his hands and knees here, I answered, inspecting the handprints he indicated. Something, he corrected, as if reasoning with an obstinate child. 
Does not Monsieur behold that the first finger is the longest? Which proves nothing, I defended. There are many hands like that. Oh, yes, he replied with that queer upward accent of his. And where has Monsieur seen hands like that before? Oh, many times, I assured him somewhat vaguely, for there was a catch at the back of my throat as I spoke. Try as I would, I could recall only three pairs of hands with that peculiarity. His little black eyes rested steadily on me in an unwinking stare, and the corners of his mouth curved upward in a malicious grin. It seemed, almost, as if he found a grim pleasure in thus driving me into a corner. See here, Pierre, I began testily, equally annoyed at myself and him. You know as well as I that the loop guru is an old woman's tale. Someone was looking here for tracks, and left his own while doing it. If we look among the patients here, we shall undoubtedly find a pair of hands to match these prints. God forbid, he exclaimed, crossing himself. That would be an evil day for us, monsieur. Here, Boris, he snapped his fingers to the surviving mastiff. Come and eat. The huge beast came wallowing over to him with the ungainly gait of all heavily muscled animals, stopping on his way to make a nasal investigation of my knees. Scarcely had his nose come into contact with my trousers when he leaped back, every hair in his mane and along his spine stiffly erect, every tooth in his great mouth bared in a savage snarl. But instead of the mastiff's fighting growl, he emitted only a low, frightened whine, as though he were facing some animal of greater power than himself, and knew his own weakness. Good heavens! I cried, thoroughly terrified at the friendly brute's sudden hostility. Yes. Monsieur, Geronte cut in quickly, putting his hand on the dog's collar and leading him a few paces away. It is well you should call upon the heavenly ones, for surely you have the odor of hell upon your clothes. What do you mean? I demanded angrily. How dare you? He raised a thin hand deprecatingly. Monsieur knows that he knows, he replied evenly, and what I also know. And leading Boris by the collar, he shuffled to the house. Mildred was waiting for me at the gate that evening, and again her father and mother were absent at one of their meetings. We walked silently up the path and seated ourselves on the porch steps, where the waning moon cast oblique rays through the pine branches. I think Mildred felt the tension I was drawn to, for she talked trivialities with an almost feverish earnestness, stringing her sentences together, and changing her subjects as a Navajo rug weaver twists and breaks her threads. At last I found an opening in the abatis of her small talk. Mildred, I said, very simply, for great emotions tear the ornaments from our speech. I love you, and I want you for my wife. Will you marry me, Mildred? I laid my hand on hers. It was cold as lifeless flesh, and seemed to shrink beneath my touch. Surely, dear, you must have read the love in my eyes, I urged, as she averted her face in silence. Almost from the night I first saw you, I've loved you, dear. I, O-O-H, don't. Her interruption was a strangled moan, as if wrung from her by my words. I leaned nearer her. Don't you love me, Mildred? I asked. As yet she had not denied it. For a moment she trembled, as if a sudden chill had come on her. Then, leaning to me, she clasped my shoulders in her arms, hiding her face against my jacket. John, John. You don't know what you say, she whispered disjointedly, as though a sob had torn the words before they left her lips. Her breath was on my cheek, moist and cold as air from a vault. I could feel the leatheness of her through the thin stuff of her gown, and her body was as devoid of warmth as a dead thing. You're cold, I told her, putting my arms shieldingly about her. The night has chilled you. A convulsive sob was her only answer. Mildred, I began again putting my hand beneath her chin and lifting her face to mine. Tell me, dear, what is the matter? I lowered my lips to hers. With a cry that was half scream, half weeping, she thrust me suddenly from her, pressing her hands against my breast and lowering her head until her face was hidden between her outstretched arms. I, too, started back, for in the instant our lips were about to meet, hers had writhed back from her teeth, like a dog's when he is about to spring, and a low, harsh noise, almost a growl, had risen in her throat. For God's sake, she whispered hoarsely, agony in every note of her shaking voice. Never do that again. Oh, 
My dear, dear love, you don't know how near to a horror worse than death you were. A horror worse than death? I echoed dully, pressing her cold little hands in mine. What do you mean? Mildred, loose my hands, she commanded with a quaint reversion to the speech of our ancestors. And hear me? I do love you. I love you better than life, better than death. I love you so I have overcome something stronger than the walls of the grave for your sake. But John, my very love, this is our last night together. We can never meet again. You must go, now, and not come back until tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning? I repeated blankly. What wild talk was this? Heedless of my interruption, she hurried on. Tomorrow morning, just before the sun rises over those trees, you must be here and have your prayer book with you. I listened speechless, wondering which of us was mad. By that corn crib there, she waved a directing hand. You will find three mounds. Stand beside them and read the office for the burial of the dead. Come quickly and pause for nothing on the way. Look back for nothing. Heed no sound from behind you. And for your own safety, come no sooner than to allow yourself the barest time to read your office. Bewildered, I attempted to reason with the mad woman, begged her to explain this folly, but she refused all answer to my fervid queries, nor would she suffer me to touch her. Finally, I rose to go. You will do what I ask? She implored. Certainly not, I answered firmly. John, John, have pity, she cried, flinging herself to the earth before me and clasping my knees. You say you love me. I only ask this one favor of you, only this. Please, for my sake, for the peace of the dead and the safety of the living, promise you will do this thing for me. Shaken by her abject supplication, I promised, though I felt myself a figure in some grotesque nightmare as I did it. Oh, my love, my precious love, she wept, rising and taking both my hands. At last I shall have peace, and you shall bring it to me. No, she forbade as I made to take her in my arms at parting. The most I can give you, dear, is this. She held her icy hands against my lips. It seems so little, dear, but oh, it is so much. Like a drunkard in his cups I staggered along the south road, my thoughts gone wild with the strangeness of the play I had just acted. Across the clearing came the howls of the sheep-killers, a sound I had grown used to of late. But tonight there was a deeper, fiercer timbre in their bay, a note that boded ill for man as well as beast. Louder and louder it swelled. It was rising from the field itself, now drawing nearer and nearer the road. I turned and looked. The great beasts I had seen pursuing the luckless sheep the other night were galloping toward me. A cold finger seemed traced down my spine. The scalp crept and tingled beneath my cap. There was no other object of their quest in sight. I was their elected prey. My first thought was to turn and run. But a second's reasoning told me this was worse than useless. Weakened with long illness, with an uphill road to the nearest. Shelter. I should soon be run down. No friendly tree offered asylum. My only hope was to stand and fight. Grasping my stick, I spread my feet, bracing myself against their charge. And as I waited their onslaught, there came from the shadow of the pines the shriller, sharper cry of the third beast. Like the crest of a flying, wind-lashed wave, the slighter, silver-furred brute came speeding across the meadow, its ears laid back, its slender paws spurning the sod daintily. Almost, it seemed, as if the pale shadow of a cloud were racing toward me. The thing dashed slantwise across the field, its flight converging on the line of the other two's attack. Midway between me and them it paused, hairs bristling, limbs bent for a spring. My eyes went wide with incredulity. It was standing in my defense. All the savageness of the larger beast's hunting cry was echoed in the smaller creature's bay, and with it a defiance that needed no interpretation. The attackers paused in their rush, halted, and looked speculatively at my ally. They took a few tentative steps in my direction, and a fierce whine, almost an articulate curse, went up from the silver-haired beast. Slowly the tawny pair circled and trotted back to the woods. I hurried toward the sanitarium, grasping my stick firmly in readiness for another attack. But no further cries came from the woods, and once, as I glanced back, I saw the light-haired beast trotting slowly in my wake, 
looking from right to left, as if to ward off danger. Half an hour later I looked from my window toward the house in the pines. Far down the south road, its muzzle pointed to the moon. The bright-furred animal crouched and poured out a lament to the night, and its cry was like the wail of a child in pain. Far into the night I paced my room, like a condemned convict when the vigil of the death watch is on him. Reason and memory struggled for the mastery, one urging me to give over my wild act, the other bidding me obey my promise to Mildred. Toward morning I dropped into a chair, exhausted with my objectless marching. I must have fallen asleep, for when I started up the stars were dimming in the zenith, and bands of slate, shading to amethyst, slanted across the horizon. A moment I paused, laughing cynically at my fool's errand. Then, seizing cap and book, I bolted down the stairs and ran through the paling dawn to the house in the pines. There was something ominous and terrifying in the two-toned pastel of the house that morning. Its windows stared at me with blank malevolence, like the half-closed eyes of one stricken dead in mortal sin. The little patches of hoar-frost on the lawn were like leprous spots on some unclean thing. From the trees behind the clearing an owl hooted mournfully, as if to say, Beware! Beware! And the wind soughing through the black pine boughs echoed the refrain ceaselessly. Three mounds, sunken and weed-grown, lay in the unkempt thicket behind the corn-crib. I paused beside them, throwing off my cap and adjusting my stole hastily. Thumbing the pages to the committal service, I held the book close, that I might see the print through the morning shadows, and commenced. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Almost beside me, under the branches of the pines, there rose such a chorus of howls and yelps I nearly dropped my book. Like all the hounds in the kennels of hell, the sheep-killers clamoured at me, rage and fear, and mortal hatred in their cries. Through the bestial cadences, too, there seemed to run a human note, the sound of voices heard before beneath these very trees. Deep and throaty, and raging mad, two of the voices came to me, and, like the tremolo of a violin lightly played in an orchestra of brass, the shriller cry of a third beast sounded, as the infernal hubbub rose at my back, I half turned to fly. Next instant I grasped my book more firmly and resumed my office, for like a beacon in the dark, Mildred's words flashed on my memory. Look back for nothing. Heed no sound behind you. Strangely, too, the din approached no nearer, but as though held by an invisible bar, stayed at the boundary of the clearing. Man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live, and is full of misery. Deliver us from all our offences. O oh, Lord, deliver us not into the bitter pains of eternal death, and to such an accompaniment, surely, as no priest ever before chanted the office, I pressed through the brief service to the final Amen. Tiny grouts of moisture stood out on my forehead. My breath struggled in my throat as I gasped out the last word. My nerves were frayed to shreds, and my strength nearly gone as I let fall my book, and turned upon the beasts among the trees. They were gone. Abruptly as it had begun, their clamour stopped, and only the rotting pine needles, lightly gilded by the morning sun, met my gaze. A light touch fell in the palm of my open hand, as if a pair of cool, sweet lips had laid a kiss there. A vapour like swamp fog enveloped me. The outbuildings, the old, stone-curbed well where I had drunk the night I first saw Mildred, the house itself, all seemed fading into mist and swirling away in the morning breeze. A, 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 but Monsieur will do himself an injury, sleeping on the wet earth. Old Geronte bent over me his arm beneath my shoulders. Behind him, great Boris, the Mastiff, stood wagging his tail, regarding me with doggish good humour. Pierre, I muttered thickly, how came you here? This morning, going to my tasks, I saw Monsieur run down the road like a thing pursued. I followed quickly, for the woods hold terrors in the dark. Monsieur, I looked toward the farmhouse. Only a pair of chimneys, Rising stark and bare from a crumbling foundation were there. Fence, well, barn, all were gone, and in their place a thicket of sumac and briars, tangled and overgrown as though undisturbed for thirty years. The house, Pierre, where is the house? I croaked, sinking my fingers into his withered arm. House, he echoed, 
Oh, but of course, there is no house here, monsieur, nor has there been for years. This is an evil place, monsieur. It is best we quit it, and that quickly. There be evil things that run by night. No more, I answered, staggering toward the road, leaning heavily on him. I brought them peace, Pierre. He looked dubiously at the English prayer book I held. A Protestant clergyman is a thing of doubtful usefulness to the orthodox French Canadian. Something of the heartsick misery in my face must have touched his kind old heart, for at last he relented, shaking his head pityingly and patting my shoulder gently, as one would soothe a sorrowing child. Perhaps, monsieur, he conceded. Perhaps. Who shall say no? Love and sorrow are the purchase price of peace. Yes. Did not Le Bon Dieu so buy the peace of the world? End of the Phantom Farmhouse by Seabury Quinn An odd little tale that you can read in five minutes. The Sign from Heaven By a Havdal First published Weird Tales, October 1923 Daniel Diggs, the honest sexton, had dug three graves today and was unusually tired. One of the graves was in very stony ground, making his task doubly hard. It was the grave of an old recluse. Hard and stony was his life, and hard and stony is his grave, thought the worthy Mr. Diggs, for gravity must be expected from grave diggers. This recluse had lived in a tumble-down shanty near the cemetery. No one knew or cared how long. How he managed to subsist, no one knew or cared. Children called him Old Man Simon, but grown-ups generally called him Simple Simon. Whether Simon was his first or last name, no one knew or cared. Mr. Diggs, who was of a pious mind, had on several occasions tried to turn old Simon's thoughts to religion, but his exhortations fell on stony ground. Old Simon cared nothing for the sexton's preachments but he was very fond of the sexton's little boy, Danny. You come to see if old Simon has any gold in his house, the recluse would say to Mr. Diggs. Simon has no gold. And then the foolish old man wept. Danny, he would say to the sexton's lad, when old Simon dies, he will take you with him and show you a tree with golden leaves. And the foolish old man laughed. A tree with golden leaves, with golden leaves. Little Danny would open his eyes wide. Yesterday morning Mr. Diggs had walked past old Simon's hut, and had seen the old man sitting by the window. In the evening he passed by again, and the old man was still sitting by the window in the same position. The sexton entered the hut, but the old man did not stir. The dead never do. As soon as it became known in the village that the old hermit was dead, there was a rush of people to the hut. Does not everybody love to believe that all hermits are rich old misers with stacks of gold hidden in their huts? In less than half an hour, the gold seekers had literally torn the hut to pieces, but not a piece of gold did they find. Mr. Diggs had dug the hermit's grave beside a big tree underneath which old Simon had loved to sit by the hour. During the summer when the weather was fine, the demented old man would sometimes climb up into the tree and sleep in the branches all night. To passers-by on the road, he looked like a great shaggy orang-outang huddled up in the branches of the tree. Mr. Diggs laid down his pick, took up his empty dinner pail, and started for home. The dinner pail was not quite empty. He had left a piece of cake in it, as usual, for Danny. The little boy always came running down to the gate to meet his father and to relieve him of his dinner pail. Yesterday, for the first time, Mr. Diggs absent-mindedly had eaten everything in his pail, forgetting to leave a dainty for Master Diggs. When he noticed it, he was quite distressed, and not wishing to disappoint the child with an empty dinner pail. He had plucked a beautiful red rose from a grave, and carried it home in the pail. The sexton had felt that it was not quite right for him to pick the flower, but he had soothed his conscience by telling himself that he would never do it again. The child was more than pleased with the flower, and even pinned it on his nightgown when he went to bed. Mr. Diggs had now walked down to the cemetery gate, and as he turned to open it, he saw a small white figure dancing around old Simon's open grave. A flaming red rose was pinned on the white gown. Danny! Danny! What do you mean? cried Mr. Diggs. 
the sexton dropped his pail and ran as fast as his rheumatic legs would carry him to the grave. No Danny was there, but a small empty white nightgown with a gorgeous red rose fastened on it was dangling over the grave. Mr. Diggs was not superstitious. He had worked among tombstones for twenty years without seeing a ghost, but now he rubbed his eyes and trembled. As the white gown floated over Simon's grave, the rose became unfastened and the wind whirled it away, but the gown fell into the open grave. My boy is dead, cried the terrified sexton. It is a sign from heaven. He ran like mad down the road to his cottage. When he reached his home, no Danny met him at the gate. He burst into the house and cried out, Where is Danny? Why, Danny went down the road an hour ago to meet you, his wife answered, terribly frightened. He is dead, he is dead, moaned the sexton. I saw his ghost. No, no, said his wife, although deathly pale herself. She tried to calm him. Mr. Diggs told his wife of the white empty gown, which he saw dancing over old Simon's empty grave, though neither spoke of it. They both thought of the old hermit's words. Danny, when I die, I will take you with me, and show you a tree with golden leaves. We must go to the cemetery, his wife said tremblingly. They started down the road together, but the wife outran her husband and reached the cemetery first. She rushed to the open grave and looked down. There was little Danny's nightgown. The mother was almost beside herself. Wicked old Simon, what have you done with my boy? She wept. She was answered by a great shaking and breaking of branches of the big tree beside the grave. She was too terrified to look up. Had old Simon returned to life and climbed up into the tree? Mr. Diggs now came panting to the grave. There was another crashing and breaking of branches, and little Danny came sliding down the tree trunk with a big leather bag on his shoulder. Look what I got, Ma. Look what I got, Pa, shouted Danny. A bag of gold money. Where did you get it? Where have you been? chorused his parents. Oh, but I scared you, Pa, laughed Danny, jumping up and down. And you didn't see me hiding up in the tree. I tied my nightgown on a string and was waving it over the grave. How could you do such a thing, Danny? asked his father sternly. Don't you know it's April Fool's Day and my birthday and everything? questioned Danny. His father opened up the leather bag. Impossible, he gasped. Gold dollars, gold dollars. Danny explained how he had found the bag hidden in a hollow far up in the trunk of the tree in which he was hiding. The hollow was overgrown with moss, but when climbing down, he had put his foot through the moss covering and had discovered the heavy leather bag. Uncomplainingly, the tired father carried the bag of gold home. He counted the money out on the table. One thousand nine hundred and twenty-three dollars in gold. A dollar for every year of the Christian era, exclaimed the pious Mr. Diggs. Truly, it was enough to make even a worldly man rejoice spiritually. Danny had indeed discovered the tree with the golden leaves. End of the Sign from Heaven by a Havdal A creepy story told in a quaint way by Arthur Edwards Chapman, The Inn of Dread. First published Weird Tales October 1923 Take care, Owens, I remember I had said to him, for mine host tells me that the road hath fallen into bad repute of late, though, truth to tell, t'was never what one might call well favoured, and I had laughed, and he with me. The pair of us had but just returned from the campaign on the peninsula, and, I having some business of a private nature, to look to in Bristol. It was decided that the Major should proceed to Bath, and there await me, knowing, from the conversation of mine host of the Woolpack the previous night, the unsettled state of the highway, I had taken the opportunity of placing my friend on his guard, ere he commenced the journey. Never fear, John, he had replied carelessly. I am a soldier, remember, and take no count of common footpads. Nonetheless tis for you to ride warily, for a blow in the dark is easily struck. Besides, you have my lady's diamonds and those, added to what you yourself carry, form a tempting haul to any knight of the road. Never fear, he had said again. They will not find Howell Owens asleep. Farewell till we meet in Bath. Mounting, he had waved lightly to me and ridden off. 
leaving me gazing after him with doubt in my heart, for I liked not the tales I had heard. And thus it was that on the third day after this, having transacted my business satisfactorily, I found myself struggling blindly against what surely must have been the foulest storm since the creation. Or, so it seemed to me. In all truth, t'was a wretched night. The wind howled and whistled through the naked branches of the trees, which seemed to complain one to the other with great creakings and groanings. The rain drove before it in a beating, soaking deluge, pit-pit patting on the mud of the road around me. The thunder rolled and growled in the distance, coming gradually nearer and louder till it burst overhead with a reverberating, ear-splitting crash to the accompaniment of blinding flashes of lightning that revealed the whole dreary, sodden landscape. A truly wild and terrible night, and one that not even a dog would be out in of its own free will. And yet here was I, Colonel John Wycombe, of His Majesty's R&D Regiment of Foot, plodding on through it all, ankle-deep in mud, and, it would appear, miles from even the outskirts of civilization, when by good rights I should have been seated before a blazing fire in the best house in Orbath, soaking the inside with the choice of mine host's cellars, rather than soaking outside in this plaguey storm. Damn the Frenchman! He was responsible. You see, the mayor had received a bullet at Badajos, and the wound, breaking out afresh, had been the cause of us landing in this pretty pickle. However, t'was no use crying over spilt milk. We must perforce make the best of bad luck, and what progress we could against the elements. We might, perchance, discover some lonely farmhouse, or even cheering thought, some wayside inn that would at least afford shelter for the pair of us. Now scarce had this thought crossed my mind than in front of me, some distance up the road, my eye caught a tiny twinkling spot which might have been a star, but that there were no others visible. The shepherds of Bethlehem could not have welcomed the guiding star more than I welcomed that point of light, and with a word of encouragement to the mare, I pressed forward with renewed hope. Gradually the beacon became larger and assumed a definite shape, a square latticed window. Then, as the rain beat down with increased fury, and the thunder rolled more and more deafeningly, a flash of lightning, more vivid and more intensely blue than any as yet, pierced the blackness like a knife, giving me a brief glimpse of an old, weather-beaten building. And above the door a signboard that creaked dismally as it swung in the wind. But it was the inscription that caused an unexplainable, indescribable shiver to run swiftly down my spine, which immediately gave place to a clammy, heated perspiration, and I trembled. I, John Wycombe, who had passed through the greatest battles of the campaign without turning a hair, trembled like a little child with an awful, nameless dread as I beheld the words. The bleeding heart, and, beneath, a crude design of a heart dripping blood. This I saw for merely a second, and then it vanished, leaving me standing there, a pale phosphorescent glow floating before my eyes, until a cold hand touched mine and took the bridle from me. With an effort, I pulled myself together, and as my vision slowly became clearer, I could distinguish a figure, exceedingly tall and thin, that, when I addressed it, simply shook its head and pointed to its ears and mouth, motioning me to follow. This strange guide led the way to what had once been a serviceable stable, but which was now sorely in need of repair. Having seen to it that the mare was provided for, and washed and dressed her wound as well as might be, I returned and entered the doorway of the inn. A rough night and a wet, sir, is it not? said a deep rasping voice at my elbow. I turned suddenly at the words, thinking to see some big, bluff personage. But what I did see was the direct antithesis of the voice in a small, undersized hunchback who stood before me, rubbing his thin hands together and staring at me with a smile half servile, half sardonic upon his lips and as I gazed at this creature the same unaccountable feeling of revulsion passed over me as when the lightning revealed that sign of the bleeding heart. For his eyes were green and seemed to look right through me as at the shades of departed souls. In fact, so strong was this feeling that instinctively I glanced over my shoulder, expecting to see I know not what. But there was naught but impenetrable darkness and the pit-pit pat of rain, which brought me back to the present, and reminded me that I was wet and hungry, while a huge fire blazed on the open hearth within. 
Damn, host, said I. You're right. Tis as evil a night as I remember. Quickly, bring out your best, for I'm famished and chilled to the very marrow. You shall have it, sir, he replied. Tis plain fare, truly, for tis rarely now that these walls see company, but none the less tis wholesome, and the contents of my cellars are not to be surpassed. The green eyes peered through me as he spoke, and then he shuffled slowly from the room, while I, casting off my dripping cloak and discarding my long riding boots, stretched my body at full length in the big armchair, and cast about me to see what manner of place I had come to. The room was nigh as tumble down as the outside had appeared to be. It was roughly square, but was broken by many corners and recesses into the shadows of which the feeble light of the candles could not penetrate. The single window was minus many of its diamond panes, and what remained were cracked and broken, admitting fierce gusts of air which caused the candles to gutter noisily. There was about the place a peculiar earthy smell, a mouldering smell indicative of neglect and decay, but which, to my overstrained senses, conveyed the impression of a newly opened tomb. Somewhere without, the water dripped from the roof on to some metal article with a hollow, ringing plom plom plom, so that I was fain to draw my chair nearer to the fire, and was right glad when the innkeeper returned, bringing food and drink, plain, as he had said, but wholesome, and I fell to heartily. Now, as I proceeded to satisfy the need of the inner man, what should that knave of a hunchback do but take up from the table, where I had laid them, my sword and pistols? Ho, there, rascal, I bellowed, springing up. What are you at, think you? Replace them at once, ere I knock that hump from your back. Nay, sir, said he, dropping the things as though they burnt him. I meant no harm. I was but going to convey them to your chamber, as is my custom with what few guests come this way. Well, well, tis all right. There's no bones broken, I assured him, sinking down again. But long companionship with danger makes an old campaigner wary of parting with his best friends, and I arranged the weapons carefully at my elbow. I did not think at the moment, sir, said the fellow apologetically, for tis rare any traveller stops at this poor place. I wondered at the man's persistence, for twas the third time he had referred to his lack of trade. Why should he be so particular to impress this facet upon me? Your business is not so prosperous these days? I asked him. No, sir, yours is the first strange foot that has trod this floor this six days. I looked at the fellow hardly as he said this, for my eye, wandering round the room, had espied at that instant, on a little shelf to the left of the fireplace, a pistol of peculiar workmanship, the like of which I had seen but once before in the possession of my friend and brother officer, Major Owens. Yet, if it were his, how did it come here? Certainly he had passed along this road three days before on his way to Bath, where I should have met him this very night, but he could not have stayed here. For did not the innkeeper himself say that no stranger had set foot in the place for six days? Nonetheless I was not satisfied with this reasoning, and a sudden suspicion flashing across my mind, I got up from the table and stepped over to the shelf. You're not minus a sting, host, said I, taking up the weapon and weighing it carefully in my hand. No, he answered slowly, and his green eyes contracted like those of a cat in the strong light till they were little more than slits. The toy is not mine, but was left accidentally by a traveller some weeks ago. Mine has a louder bark, and he pointed to a large blue bus that hung on the wall. Then I knew that the knave lied, for on the butt of the pistol I had seen the letters E. O. Slowly I replaced it on the shelf, carelessly remarking that the man who left it behind was no soldier. But I was thinking rapidly, and, as I thought, the horror of the place returned, and the previous suspicion gave place to dreadful certainty. I became convinced that the Major had met with foul play and several little incidents of which I had not taken much note, now became full of awful significance. The fact of the inn being open at that late hour now savoured of a trap. Then there was the deafness of the tall man. Anything might happen, and he would not hear it. And again, why was the hunchback so desirous of carrying off my weapons? Or why tell a deliberate lie if he were an honest man? Here was a mystery which I determined to get to the bottom of and heaven help the villain if my fears proved correct. Quickly I decided on a course of action. 
Well, host, said I, tis a rare vintage of yours, and I should sleep well upon it, for I'm mightily tired. Pulling out my purse, so that it jangled noisily, I poured some of the contents into my palm and carelessly picked out a couple of crowns. These I flung upon the table, watching the rogue narrowly the while. He scarce gave a glance at the coins I had given him, but his eyes feasted on the bulky purse and glittered with a greedy light, and, minding the jewels which Owens carried, I could no longer doubt. There, said I, take those for the nonce, and if I sleep sound, you shall have more. Now show me to my chamber and I will go to bed. Thank you, sir, thank you. You do my poor hospitality honour and again that sardonic smile so full of unfathomable meaning. This way, sir, this way, he continued. Tis a soft, clean bed as you will find. I followed him up a rickety, creaking staircase, terminating in a small landing with a door on either side and a small window facing us. One of these doors he opened. There you are, sir, said he. Now I will leave you and retire myself, for the hour is late. I trust you will sleep well. Never yet have I had a complaint from any who occupied this chamber. Indeed, all have slept exceeding sound. Putting the candle on a small dressing stand, he looked through me once with his cat's eyes, and I was alone. Alone, yes. But sleep? No. Nothing was farther from me, for I was wrestling with this great problem that faced me. I felt perfectly sure that this inn of dread contained the secrets of a tragedy if not of tragedies, and was determined to search them out. To my mind, the place was but a trap for the unwary traveller. Surely there was something horribly, suggestively sinister in those parting words of the hunchback. Indeed, all have slept exceeding sound. With a grim smile, I took up my position on a chair behind the door so that if it opened I should be hid from view, and placed my drawn sword across my knees and my pistol ready in my hand. I should not sleep. Here I would wait until all was quiet, and if no one came to disturb me I should have to go and disturb them. First I would search the building for any further evidence of Owen's fate. If nothing was to be discovered, then that rascally innkeeper should explain how he came to be in possession of that pistol. I know not how long I sat thus, but on a sudden my nerves were set all of a tingle by a great cry, as of someone in mortal terror and physical anguish, and yet having in it a note of grim triumph. For an instant I remained still, my heart beating a rapid tattoo against my ribs, and something of my old horror of the place returning. Then, my sword firmly grasped in one hand and pistol in the other, I cautiously opened the door and stepped out onto the landing. The bright, full moon had risen, and, revealed in its pale ray, was the diminutive figure of the hunchback. He was clad only in his nightshirt, and the green eyes were closed while from his lips issued broken, half-audible sentences. The knife. I must have it. How sticky his blood is. He, he, he. Came in low, hollow tones, and I strained my ears to catch more. Shh, he sleeps. One swift stroke. And who is the wiser? And again that horrible chuckle that made my blood run cold. Once more the sleepwalker's lips moved as his still active brain conjured up some fresh vision of his crime. Silently, quickly, and the purse is mine. How quiet he lies. But the knife is sharp, so sharp. Ho, ho, ho. See, his eyes are open. He sees, but it is too late. One swift stroke, and one only. Ah, H. I shuddered at the awful significance of his words, and could hardly keep myself from springing upon the self-convicted murderer, for here seemed to be the confirmation of my suspicions. But as I hesitated, the sleepwalker spoke again. There, tis done. He was quiet before, but he is quieter now. He, he, the pretty stones, how they sparkle. Why should he have them and mean nothing? But now they are mine, all mine. Ho, ho, tis a fat purse. Also, how it jingles. He sleeps sound. Where shall his bed be? Beneath the stair, the knife. I must have it. Slowly, the sleepwalker moved, turning his head neither to right nor left. Outside the water dripped with that ringing, metallic sound which I have mentioned. The sleeper must have heard it, for he stopped and appeared to listen. 
how sticky his blood is. Hark, drip, drip, drip. Blood, everywhere is blood. Where is the knife? I must get it. And he glided silently down the creaking, shaking stair, gripping my weapons firmly. I followed. Swiftly, relentlessly, as a cat follows a mouse. At the bottom he went on his knees and commenced to prise up the floorboards with his fingers. Three planks did he take up as I watched, and again there assailed my nostrils the mouldy, decaying smell. Filled with deadly fear, I sprang forward and my startled gaze fell upon the body of my poor friend lying between the scantlings, a large knife buried up to the handle in his breast, while the sleepwalker, chuckling hideously, strove to pull it free. A blind, unreasoning fury swept over me. I became for an instant as a madman. Leaping upon the vile monster, I seized him by the throat and drove my sword again and again, wildly, fiercely, into his body, so that he fell, without a cry, across the corpse of his victim, his lifeblood spurting forth from his black heart and mingling with the dust. Then, pausing not an instant, I turned and fled from the accursed place and breathed not till it was far behind. End of the Inn of Dread by Arthur Edwards Chapman This is the end of the story. Tell us what you think in the comment section. Please subscribe and ring the notification bell so you'll be the first to know when we release new content. If you want to support us, consider joining our channel membership. You will get instant early access to more than a hundred stories before their release. This is the only way to support our channel.